now you're all tired? along this road and from our 
are left to our right as well too on the morning of July 1st, 1863. They're heading out to the west side of town and the north side of town. That's where the fighting is going to occur on July 1st, the first day of the battle. Well, by 4.30 in the afternoon, things are not going so well for the Union. And all those Union troops are going to come running back through these streets. Now, Hannah Garland, she lived over on Baltimore Street, the road we came up when we came off Cemetery Hill there. She lived over there and she wrote about seeing so many men run back through the town that she could have walked across their heads and not touched the road. So many men are running back through the town. The Confederates right behind them. The Confederates will occupy the town and hold it until early in the morning on July 3rd or July 4th. The civilians will go down into their cellars. That is the safest place for them to be. And that's where they'll spend their time during the battle. Some of the women will come out and work in some of these uh, churches tended to the wounded soldiers that will be there. The men, a lot of the men in town, they will take the valuables, the horses, the cows, things like that, and they will head east. So that's why you'll hear a lot about just women and children being here in the town of Gettysburg because the men have taken all these. Well, these are the money stuff, and even the uh, elected officials, some of them are free. They're going to be captured and taken back south, so they they leave the area as well, too, like the postmaster. He gets out of here in a hurry. Now, out here, this area out here is all open ground. All right, so we've left the town of Gettysburg. We're heading west still. Robert E. Lee, who commands the Confederate Army in Northern Virginia, he has 75,000 men under his command. He's going to come up to Pennsylvania for a few reasons, and one of those reasons is he wants to fight a battle. He doesn't care where it's at. He just wants to win it. And he's hoping that that victory will put pressure on Lincoln, and Lincoln will sue for peace, and that will give the Confederacy their nation. To your left, the Lutheran Theological Seminary. We'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, when we go through it, but that was here at the time of the battle, but only three buildings. The other thing Robert E. Lee's doing when he comes up here to Gettysburg is he's gathering, or Pennsylvania, is he's gathering supplies. Anything and everything that the Army can use, his Army has taken, and they are spread out from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, in front of us, about 26 miles away, all the way up to Carlisle, 40 miles to our north. Spread out to cover more ground. Gather up more stuff that the armies will need. Now he's paying for it with Confederate money, which ain't worth the paper it's printed on. It's worth more now than it was then. So as we go over these ridges here, right, these ridges will continue out to the west. They're like the waves on the ocean or the ruffled potato chips. Right? The Union Army will use these to slow down the Confederate advance on July 1st, 1863. Right, we'll talk about that a little bit more once we get out of here as well, too. Right, our first stop. To our left is the McPherson Barn. The McPherson Barn. I'm trying to train myself to say it properly. So that's the McPherson Barn. We're on McPherson's Ridge. That barn was here at the time of the battle. The two big statues here to your right. You got uh, General Reynolds on the horse, and you got General Buford down here standing there. He's the cavalry commander that will fight in the action out here on July 1st, 1863. John Reynolds is a corps commander. He's going to command close, just over 11,000 men that will fight here on the morning and afternoon of July 1st. Out here under this shade tree, we're going to talk a little bit about the fighting out here before we go on to our next stop. All right, if you got any questions while everybody's getting off the bus, you know, now that'll be a good time to ask them and when we're getting back on the bus. All right.
Virginia worm. That's what they call that, Virginia worm. It's a temporary fence. So with that fence behind you is a posted rail that is a more permanent fence. The fields are going to be full of crops, not animals, like we just saw over there underneath that shade tree, all those cows laying there. The animals are in the woods. So the woods will be more open than what you see now. Temporary fences would be along the wood lots. You drop those fences in the winter after the crops are in, and the cows can go fertilize the field. But the farmer, you want every inch of ground in those fields to be the crops. They didn't have to fertilize them. All right? Monuments. We got a little one there. All right? You've seen a few around the battlefield. We got John Burns here to my right. There's over 1,300 monuments on this battlefield. Most of these, like the one there behind you, and there in the edge of the woods, are put here by the soldiers. They come back in the 1880s and the 1890s and put them where they fought. John Burns, I mentioned him earlier. He's the second civilian casualty here at Gettysburg. He's 70 years old. He's going to be out on Chambersburg Street trying to get the other men, the ones that are still in town, to come out here and join the fight. Well, they don't. He comes out here, and they said he had a top hat on and, and a coat with tails and a flintlock rifle and a powder horn. And he falls in with 150th Pennsylvania down there. Their monument's just on the other side of where all those uh, reeds are, that little quarry hole there. The colonel of the 150th was... 50th will say, don't fight out here, we're out here in the open. Go in the woods, fight with those Wisconsin boys. Their monument's just in the side of the trees there, that's the 7th Wisconsin. So that's where Burns will go. And he's wounded during the fighting on the afternoon of July 1st at least three times. When the Confederates take him home, after he tells them a lie about being out here and being wounded, wife opens the door and says, I told you not to go out there. <laughs> All right. Any questions? All right. So on the morning of July 1st, 1863, the first shot of the Battle of Gettysburg will be fired about a mile and a half to our west. Right. And from 7.30 until 9 o'clock, that Union Cavalry under John Buford will be slowing down that Confederate advance. See where that silo top is over there? That's on Hare Ridge. H-E-R-R. -R. Like a potato chip. The Confederates reach that point by 9 o'clock, and at 10 o'clock they start moving this way. John Reynolds, whose statue is over there, he commands that Union First Corps. His 11,000 men will join the 3,000 Union horsemen under John Buford on this hill. That woodlot we're about to go through is going to be the scene of some of the heaviest fighting of the Battle of Gettysburg. Those soldiers will talk about the smoke in there being so thick that they have to kneel down the fire underneath it just to see what you're shooting at. And as we go through the woods, and we'll talk a little bit about that fighting that goes on out there. John Reynolds will end up being killed by 1030. He's barely even in the fight before he is down. So one of the old local lore stories, all right, local lore. Okay, some guy made this story up a long time ago. Reynolds statue's got two feet up. His horse has two feet up. The story goes that he was killed, right? So if you're killed in battle, two hooves are up. If you're wounded, one's up. If all four are down, you survive the battle. Truth of the matter is, 
the sculptor of that statue over there had a bet with a fellow sculptor and he bet he could put a 16 ton monument on two points. So, and we got a letter <laughs> that verifies that. But it makes a good story because it does work out here at Gettysburg until they put the long streets down. Any questions? You know, I forgot to tell you one thing. I forgot to tell you how big George Meade's army is, the Army of the Potomac. He's got 90,000 men he's going to bring to Gettysburg. Wow. So between Lee and George Meade, there's going to be 170,000 men show up wow. here in Gettysburg. Wow. Now, as we enter this woodlot, this has been McPherson's Woods. The Confederates will be coming from our right on the morning of July 1st and on the afternoon of July 1st. In the morning of the 1st, the Confederates will be forced back. In the afternoon, more Confederates will arrive on the field and attack through here. And the 24th Michigan and the 26th North Carolina will be within 30 paces of each other, blazing away. These two regiments will suffer the highest casualty rates in both armies. So the 24th Michigan in the Union, and then the 26th North Carolina in the Confederate. The rifle they're using can hit a target 800 yards away, and they're standing 30 paces from each other. So, and they're blazing away in these fields and in these woods to our left and our right. Now in front of us, you got the Lutheran Theological Seminary. That will be used as an observation post by both armies, just not at the same time. Line of monuments here. This is where men stood in battle. Coming up on our left, the Union Army, the Iron Brigade specifically, will be pushed back through those woods because the Confederates will be flanking them behind you. And right over here to our left is where John Reynolds will fall. He falls, like I said, at 10.30 in the morning. And Captain Vail, who's his staff officer, will say that's the most effective bullet he ever saw during the American Civil War. <laughs> that he was dead before he hit the ground. Yep. Oh. When he goes down, though, Abner Doubleday will take over. So a great big baseball game breaks out. It's the same after Doubleday, all right, that uh, changed the rules of the game that already existed. But Doubleday will try and hold off those Confederate attacks on the afternoon of July 1st, but they will be overwhelmed and pushed back to the seminary over there. They will make their last stand over there between 4 and 4.30. That is when the Union Army will be flanked on both ends. On the far left, out here, on the right, as we're looking at it, but on their left, and on their right, and on your left, as we're looking at it, all right, out north of town. And then both flanks between 4 and 4.30, the Confederates will enforce the Union back into town. Robert E. Lee arrives on the field around 1 o'clock in the afternoon on July 1st. He will occupy this stone building here to our left, and that will be his headquarters throughout the rest of the battle. Now he won't stay a lot, stay there a lot, but he will try and catch a few Z's there and uh, maybe get a bite of heat. But he will be around the battlefield meeting with his subordinates. Now as we head south, we're going to be passing through the seminary. At the time of the battle, though, it only had three buildings. And the first one here is the Charles Croft House. Charles and his wife will leave the battle area, come back when the fighting is over. Blood stains all over their floors, their carpets are ruined. Her china was all over the yard, but not a piece of it was broken. <laughs> the large four-story building here on our left, that is Schmucker Hall. I already mentioned the cupola on top was used as an observation post, but the primary purpose of this building is a hospital. And on that first floor there is where the surgeons are doing their work. 
if you are hit in the arm or the leg, the only thing they can do for you is saw it off and throw it out the window. They said those arms and legs reach to the base of those first four windows. That's how many arms and legs they're amputated. Then you got Dr. Schmucker's house here to your left. Dr. Schmucker's not kin to the jelly people. He is an abolitionist, though. You know what an abolitionist is? No. <laughs> abolitionists are against slavery. So he's going to do a lot of writing against slavery before the war starts. And he's afraid that he'll be captured and taken back south and home. So he heads east as well. And he comes back, his house is ransacked, just, just like all the others. His house has a cannonball in it, there was some battle damage, there was fighting all around these homes and in this seminary on July 1st, 1863. There's a South Carolina brigade that's going to break the Union line right here where we're parked and push those Confederates, or push those Union troops out of here. Large house there to your front left was here at the time of the Battle of the well too, but it had nothing to do with the battle. That house has at least two cannonballs in it and a lot of mini ball holes, the bullets that they're shooting at each other. If you got $850,000, you can buy it right now. It's going to take you that much to heat it in the winter, though. Now the road to your right, that is going to be the road that the Confederate Army retreats out on on July 5th. That's the route they will take. Just to your left on the other side of the trees here is the town of Gettysburg. So back to the first, they're all going to be rushing back through town. Confederates right behind them. Union Army will lose about 5,000 men captured in the town. I mentioned Anna Garlich earlier. Her mother will go out to the woodshed to get some, uh, to get the slop to feed the pigs. And when she goes out there to that woodshed, she will find General Schimmel fitting. He's hiding. He's a Union general. He's trying to evade capture. She will feed him for the next three or four days until the Union Army retakes the town and he goes back and joins his troops, but he, he evades that capture. In that retreat, the Union Army will lose by itself just 5,000 men being captured. The total casualties for July 1st, 1863 is 16,000 men. Just one day's of fighting. The Union Army will be pushed over to Cemetery Hill, which is to your left, you may be able to see a water tower over there peeking out of the trees. So that's where the Union Army will go to. We're following the Confederate battle line along Seminary Ridge. Now the nice road we're driving on wasn't here at the time of the battle. And as we go through the battlefield, if, it, if a road's an avenue, you know what here? If it's a road pike or a street, it was. So Robert E. Lee We'll start extending his line on July 1st, that evening, along this ridge. George Meade over there on Cemetery Ridge, Cemetery Hill, he can stay there as long as he wants. His supply line is only 26 miles long. So he can get a wagon from Westminster, Maryland to here within the day. Robert E. Lee doesn't have that luxury. His supply line is 180 miles long goes all the way down to Stanton, Virginia. It's going to take him a week to get a wagon up here. So that's why on July 2nd and July 3rd, Lee will be hammering that position over there where those monuments are across that field on July 2nd and July 3rd, because he's got to defeat George Meade and spread back out and start gathering supplies again and living off the land. These guns we're passing on our left, they were here, or uh, they represent the Confederate battle line on July 2nd, July 3rd. We're going to hop out here. We're going to set up July 2nd and July 3rd, 1863. We're going to go out underneath those trees over there.
soldiers depicted in Pickett's charge on that monument. That monument was dedicated in 1929. The soldier on the bottom, all we can see of him is his hand pointing across the field. He is pointing to Cemetery Ridge, which if we look out here across these fields, you've got a white house and a white barn out there. There's a car about to move in front of it. Off to the left of that under those trees is Cemetery Hill. At the time of the battle, there are no trees over there. That white house and white barn moved to the right. Got a line of monuments. Got a large obelisk over there. You got a dome monument. That's the Pennsylvania State Monument. Behind the barn, you got some hills that start moving to the right. The one furthest to the right with all the trees on it is Big Round Top. The one just to the left of it is Little Round Top. The Union line will run from Little Round Top all the way up Cemetery Ridge behind that barn where those monuments are now to Cemetery Hill, curve around a Culp's Hill that we can't see right now. That's your fish hook. So that's how big it is. It's three miles long. When we get up on Little Round Top, I'll be able to show you the majority of that. Robert E. Lee's line, he's on a yeah, fish hook too, but he's on the outside. Meade's line is three, three miles long. Lee's is seven. And on the afternoon, or on the morning of July 2nd, Lee will send two divisions, 16,000 men, through the valley behind us there, all the way down to the southern end of the field. He wants to get them in position down there and attack the flank of the Union Army. Lee believes the flank of the Union Army, you know what the flank is? The end of the line. He believes the end of the line is behind that red barn out there. So he wants the Confederate forces to attack from the south to the north and roll up that Union line. Well, so things are going to change, and by the time when we get down to that end of the field, I'll tell you how they change, all right? July 3rd, 1863. Robert E. Lee is still looking at that same position over there. He's captured prisoners from every corps in the Union Army on Little Round Top and on Culp's Hill. The Union Army has seven corps here, and the Confederates have three. So Lee knows that the Union Army has reinforced the flanks of the Army. So he suspects the center of that Army is weak. Out there across the field, you see where the obelisk is? That's the monument to the U.S. regulars. To the left of that is a clump of trees. That clump of trees is the grandchildren of the original trees. But those are in the same area, same place where those trees were that Lee pointed at and told General Longstreet that's the focal point of the attack on July 3rd. Longstreet and Lee will amass 150 cannons. That's the gun line we've been seeing along the road here. It will go all the way across that field out there towards that red house or the red barn and white house out there just in front of those woods. Those guns will fire for 30 minutes on that clump of trees. And then after 30 minutes, 12,000 men will go across this field. That is Pickett's Charge. You are looking at sort of what they saw. We see monuments and cars. They saw men and guns. And as soon as those Confederates come out of these woods behind us and out in those fields out there, 
they will be under fire from at least 86 Union cannons. Some of those cannons will be all the way down on Little Round Top firing into their right flank. So that's how far these guns can shoot. Those black cannons that we're going to walk past as we head back to the bus here in a little bit, they can hit a target almost two miles away. The problem is you got to be able to see what you're shooting at. Those black cannons are rifled, spins a shell like a football. The green guns you've probably noticed along the road there, those are smooth bore. That's like throwing a basketball. They can hit a target a mile away. That barn is just short of a mile away out there. So the smooth bore guns can hit the barn. Those rifled guns will put around through a window. That's how accurate they are. Wow. How do they cool them? Huh? How do they cool them? Cool them? Well, they uh, the mountains of the car. <laughs> I know they uh, the the, the ramrod that they used to ram the shells in on one end of got a sponge, or it looks like a sponge. They dip it in a bucket of water and run it down it. That's how they try to cool it. But it's not very exactly. any flame that's in it, so that the next charge doesn't go off. Doesn't go off the board, right? right. Yep. 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 Now there. Go ahead. Oh, I thought you were. So, all right, I thought I heard somebody say, all right. So we got eight men to fire that cannon though. Right. Everybody's got their own little job they gotta do. Yeah. And then uh, it takes six horses to pull those. Those black cannon tubes weigh about 815 pounds. The green tubes weigh about 1,200 pounds. Now the green ones weren't green during the Civil War. <laughs> they are made of bronze. So they would be nice and shiny like a ship's bell here during the battle. Any questions? How far is Little Round Top? Uh, we're almost about two miles. So that could be hit. Yeah. Was there any rain during that and they were up in the mountains that would force them downward or water floods? No, so the rain. Well, the mountains are up in there and it rains. It almost flood this the new Oh, oh, yeah. uh, we haven't had a lot. We haven't had a flood since uh, over here since Agnes, '72. That bad. Uh, we've had some flooding. I was talking about during the war. Time. No, during the war. Time. How did they see all these soldiers? How'd they see them? See. Feed them. Feed them. Oh. Mm. Well. <laughs> Basically, you had a commissary sergeant and you carried wagons with the regiments and the brigades and you'd have food on those, all right, what they call three days rations. They had cattle that followed them, all right, they had herds of cattle that followed the armies and they would kill the cows and, and when they stopped. Uh, the Confederates are living off the land so they're going and buying stuff from these farms, like I mentioned, paying with Confederate money. Um, the horses, to feed those it takes 14 pounds, uh -oh, 25 pounds of uh, hay and oats. So as we go on down the road here, we're still heading south, we're still on Seminary Ridge. There's over 300 can 380 cannons on this battlefield. The majority of them are originals. We do have some fake ones out here. If you look at those cannons, once we get up on Little Round Top, You'll see markings on them, on the muzzle, and on the trunnions, which is on the sides. That'll show you that, that, they're, that they are real. Right. The carriages aren't real, they're made of iron. Right. But they're replicas of what... I had a friend. <laughs> they're replicas of what would have been used during the battle, or during the war. Now the next Confederate state monument we'll see is the Virginia Monument. It is the largest Confederate monument on the battlefield. Dedicated in 1917 and sitting up on top of it there is the statue to General Lee. Before Lee dies in October of 1870 they will do a life mask. They will put plaster of Paris on his face, stick some straws up his nose so he can breathe. 
And that's what they use when they make the statue. Traveler, the horse, they measured him and his bones after he uh, passed away. And they got the, the horse to the exact height as well, too. This is where Lee will watch Pickett's charge as it goes across the fields to your right. And when those Confederate soldiers come back, Lee will say, it's all my fault. I thought we were invincible, is what he will tell his men. The soldiers on the front there represent the different uh, occupations in the uh, uh, that are in the armies. We've got uh, Drummer Boy and uh, Bugler and, and some cavalry on that as well, too. Now, Robert E. Lee, he had graduated second in his class at West Point in 1829, so he goes into the engineers. So he's going to build a lot of forts prior to the American Civil War, up and down the East Coast. He'll also serve in the Mexican War. All right, he's going to be well respected and well thought of when the uh, war starts, and he's going to be offered command of a Union Army when the war begins. But he will turn it down because in those days you're loyal to your state. So he will go with Virginia. So that's why he doesn't uh, take command of that Union Army. He's got stronger ties to Virginia than he does to the country. Now, battlefield preservation starts on this battlefield shortly after the battle ends. Right. David McConaughey will start buying up some of the land around here and say to decide to honor the Union victory. We've got the Florida Monument there. They're just doing some work on it. Not changing anything on it. They're just working on it. <laughs> Typical, they're just normal maintenance. Um, he starts buying up land, David McConaughey does, and that is to uh, honor the Union victory. The National Park Service will take over in 1932 from the War Department. And the battlefield now is 25 square miles. It's over 6,000 acres. We're not going to see all of it today. <laughs> not on this tour. As we top the hill here, if you look to your left, you'll see a little round top out there to your front, front left, the big round top. Coming up on our right, we've got the Longstreet statue. And once we get to this fence line here, if you just peek through the trees there, that's the only statue to General Longstreet. After the war is over, he switches political parties, goes from Democrat to Republican. He's going to serve under uh, General Grant when General Grant is president. In his administration, he'll be a uh, be the ambassador to Turkey underneath uh, Grant. So he will be blamed, Longstreet will, for everything that goes wrong here at Gettysburg. And when that monument was dedicated on July 3rd, 1998, that became the first and only monument to General Longstreet. Why was he playing? Why was he? Well, primarily because uh, they, they accused him of being slow uh, on the July 2nd, but primarily because he changed parties. Yeah. <laughs> And he had the audacity to challenge Robert E. Lee. So, so as we go down the road further here, in the valley to your right, James Longstreet is moving his 16,000 men down here. They are hoping to come down here, get into position where these guns are, move out there to our left, and then attack from the south, which would be from our right to the north just to our left. Well, when those Union troops top the hill here, coming up from our right along this road, this is the Millerstown Road, it was here at the time of the battle, I've always wondered what that first South Carolinian said when he saw out there across those fields, 10,000 Union troops in the Peach Orchard. So that's going to force General Lee to change his plan. Those Union troops out there are under the command of Major General Dan Sickles. He is a New York City politician. We'll talk a little bit more about him in a little bit. But the Confederates will start to extend their line along this way because they can't move right out there now.
We're going to see some other state monuments coming up on our right. We've got the Georgia one. It's going to be the first one just past these two cannons. That's dedicated on July 3rd, 1963. Same day as that Florida one was back there that we saw the guy was working on. And then coming up on our right, we've got the South Carolina state monument. That was also dedicated on July 3rd, 1963, the 100th anniversary of the battle. That is where Georgia troops and South Carolina troops were in position on July 2nd. Just like when we were at the North Carolina Monument, that's where North Carolina troops were in that area. Now these cannons out here along the road weren't in those positions. Those guns would be a little bit further out on the hill out there. Just to our left, about 20 yards. These monuments, like I said, they're put here along the road so the veterans can get by and see them. All those turkey vultures out there, they just cut all that grass out there, so there's all kind of dead animals out there, so they're, it's buffet time for them. <laughs> now we're entering John Bell Hood's division area, and he's going to be in charge of attacking Little Round Top, which is almost directly to our left. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon on July 2nd, there is a signal station up there. The signal station is just some guys pat or waving flags, passing messages. So that's what's up there on that hill. At 4 o'clock, John Bell Hood's division will begin the attack. 4 o'clock in the afternoon on July 2nd, heading towards the little round top. John Bell Hood won't get much further than that stone house over there to your left. When an artillery shell will explode nearby him, and he will uh, be severely wounded and taken off the field. It'll take a few minutes to find the next guy in charge, so command and control of that division will start to fall apart as they advance to attack Little Round Top. <laughs> Alright, so we're going to uh, mandatory potty break here at the halfway point. This is the old uh, South End Guide Station. This is back in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s where you would pick up a guide before you toured the battlefield. Now it's the restrooms. <laughs> so, I will be just under the awning there if you got any questions about anything that's going on. Uh, or that we've talked about. That's the Eisenhower farm. That is the only farm that I, I can maybe bought. All of his other homes are provided by the government. But he bought that place in 1953. 1952, I'm sorry. And he will uh, spend a lot of time there while he's president. He will spend a lot of time there while he's recuperating from his heart attack, too. But he will uh, entertain quite a few people there. My most favorite one is Bill Marshall Montgomery, all right, from Britain. During World War II, he served under Eisenhower. Well, Montgomery wrote a lot of bad things about Eisenhower during the war, and maybe wouldn't let him in the house. So he had to stay in an office building. And supposedly, Montgomery and Eisenhower are up there on a little round top, and Eisenhower, or Montgomery says, I never would have attacked this hill. And Ike says, that's why I would have had Patton do it. <laughs> now, as we go along the road here, back to 1863, this is the Emmitsburg Road, we're heading north. The Confederate attacks will start on our right, our left, and move to our right, all right? Heading towards a little round top. And this high ground up here in front of us is the Peach Orchard. This is where Union General Dan Sickles will advance his 10,000 men, put his men in a salient. What I mean by that is if you look at my fingers, all right, that's a salient. They can get attacked on two sides simultaneously. His line will continue on, and it'll also make a right here where that white truck is and where we're about to turn. This is a 90 degree turn. Sickles will get hit on both sides of this, this position from 4 o'clock in the afternoon until 6.30 that evening on July 2nd. He is a mile in advance of where he's supposed to be. When we clear the trees here, you can see a barn. The ridge behind 
erected at Cemetery Ridge. That is where Sickles was supposed to be. But Dan didn't like that ground out there, so he comes out here against orders. And between 4 and 6.30, the Confederates will hammer this position. And at 6.30, the Brigade of Mississippians will shatter the Union line over here to your left and break that line. And all of those Union troops will be retreating through those fields back towards Cemetery Ridge, which is behind the barn, just over here to our left front. And that's the Trussell Farm. The Confederates will put cannons up on the Peach Orchard and fire into the backs and into those Union, tro into those Union troops. Dan Sickles himself will get hit. An artillery shell will hit him in the leg almost amputated. He'll go to the hospital where they will finish it. And by July 7th, he's telling Lincoln he won the Battle of Gettysburg by moving out there. Off to your left at the barn, you see the two diamonds. There's a hole underneath that right diamond. That's a cannonball hole. Now we go along the road here, this is the Millerstown Road, it was here, but now we call it the Wheatfield Road. Coming up on our right will be the Wheatfield. At the time of the battle, this wheat field, the wheat would have been about waist high, which is to our right, on the morning of July 2nd. That field is about 20 to 26 acres, depending on which book you read. And the fighting will start out there on that field around uh, 4.45 in the afternoon on July 2nd, and it will end around 8 o'clock when it gets dark. That field will change hands four times. When the fighting is over, there's almost 4,000 casualties laying in that field. Some of those guys will be Company K of the 30th Pennsylvania Reserves. They're from Gettysburg, so they're fighting on their home turf here. July 2nd in the wheat field, that field becomes a no man's land between the two lines. It will be until July 5th before Union or any medical teams get out there to take care of those soldiers. Now this area here is known as the Valley of Death or Plum Run Valley. Where we're driving through here right now, this is where the Pennsylvania Reserves will charge down that hill from our left through this swampy little ground here into the wheat field. The Pennsylvania Reserves are led by General Crawford right there. He's a doctor by trade and he's leading those men. That's part of, uh, that Company K would be a part of that. Little Round Top is there to your left. That's the way it looked at the time of the battle. The farmer who owned the land will have cleared it of all the trees. That's what's going to make it militarily important. Big round tops covered with trees, it's just to our left front. It's not going to be. It's going to take too long to cut those trees down. But Dan Sickles is supposed to have his left flank up there on the little round top. But he never moved troops up there. So he will advance his men out to the peach orchard, which he thinks is better ground than what's back here. His line will go across the wheat field and into Devil's Den, which is here to our right front. That's what all these rocks are around here. This area is known as Devil's Den. The Confederates will attack on the far side of this hill and from out of the woods in front of us about 5 o'clock in the afternoon on July 2nd. That position will remain in Union control until about 6.30. When the Union troops are forced out, the Confederates capture Devil's Den. As we go up Little Round Top here, Big Round Top is to your right. The Confederates will capture Big Round Top. But because of the trees, they can't use it, so they will keep moving. And they will come out of these woods here from our right move across this valley here and start to go up that hill. 
Some of those Confederates will have marched 25 miles to get here. It's about 85 degrees that day. These guys are wearing wool uniforms, carrying a nine-pound rifle, trying to get up that hill. And there's about a thousand Union guys up there trying to keep them from getting up that hill. A lot of those Confederates will not have water either. They will have drink all their water, or their water can't. Their canteens would have been uh, captured by the Union when the guy that went to get water was captured by. As we move through this area here, the 15th Alabama will hit the Union line up here in front of us. That is where the 20th Maine will be, under Joshua Chamberlain. Chamberlain will hold off at least five, maybe more, Confederate attacks. After the last one, he will order his men to fix bayonets and charge down the hill. And they will push the Confederates off the backside of the hill here. And that will secure a little round, the backside a little round top for the Union. Chamberlain gets the Medal of Honor for that as well. He didn't go to West Point either. He was a professor of rhetoric from Bowdoin College. So we're going to hop out of here. We're going to go to the front side of the hill. And we'll talk a little bit about what's going on on Little Round Top. of Adams County, Pennsylvania from up here. You're going to see stone walls in the weeds here. Now these stone walls up here are built by the soldiers on the night of July 2nd. The stone walls we've seen on the battlefields before here and after here are put up by the farmers. So those were here before the battle and the armies will use them. On the afternoon of July 2nd, George Meade, the Union Army Commander, will go out to the peach orchard and have a few choice words with Dan Sickles about being in the wrong place. Meade will send his chief topographical engineer up here, Governor K. Warren. Warren, his statue is right over there. Warren gets up here and he finds a signal station. 24 guys waving flags. He will order an artillery battery down there in Devil's Den, which is where those rocks are there in front of us, to fire two shots into those trees in the distance. Because behind that beige house over there, that is the Confederate battle line. When those shells explode over there, those, those Confederate troops move. Warren sees the sunlight glinting off those barrels and bayonets and knows he's got trouble. And shortly after that, 8,000 Confederates will start moving in this direction. Let me back up a minute. If you look north, there's that domed monument. The tree line behind it is Cemetery Hill. So the Union line will run from here all the way to Cemetery Hill, curve around and go to Culp's Hill. That's your three mile long battle line the Union has. That beige house across the fields, about a mile in front of us. The tree line behind it is the Confederate line. You follow that tree line all the way to the right, you got a church steeple sticking out of the trees above that red barn out there in the middle of the fields. That's a seminary. Lee's line will go all the way up to that steeple and curve through the town <coughs> and go, to Getty's, go through Gettysburg to Culp's Hill. big. 
So Warren sees those 8,000 Confederate troops moving across that valley over there this way. So he will send for help. Those staff officers will go down the north side of the hill, down there in the road where that road intersection is. One of those staff officers will be stopped by General or by Colonel Strong Vincent. Vincent will get the order, bring his brigade up here, which is about 1,500 men, put them in position. 20th Maine on the left, 16th Michigan on the right. 20th Maine will hold their position. The 16th Michigan will get flanked by the Confederates coming out of those woods over there. And they will force the 16th Michigan close to where we're standing now. But just in the nick of time, another Union regiment will arrive. That is the 140th New York comes over that hill led by Colonel Patrick O'Rourke. He will hit the left flank of those Texans right here, near where we're standing, and force them down the hill. So that will secure this position for the Union. As more Union troops arrive, they will extend their line around the front of the hill here and curve it around. They will bring six cannons up here as well, too. The problem with the cannons is they can't fire and hit the Confederates coming up the hill, but they can fire at the Confederates in Devil's Den, out at the Peach Orchard, and on July 3rd, into Pickett's Charge, which that right flank of that red barn out there with the cupolas on it is the right flank of Pickett's Charge. That's how far they can shoot. Any questions? Where did, the, where did the Unions come up from if they were surrounded? They came up the, the back side of the hill. All right, there's an old logging road that was back there at the time. So the fighting cannons up that way.
Hey, that's uh, poison ivy. Where? Uh, that. <laughs> yeah, the 20th name was just the extreme left of, uh, of uh, Vincent's brigade. Now stay with me. I, don't know very... I there was Vincent and Weed's brigade, two federal brigades on there. They held a very tight part of fish like that.
Chris Brown, he's going to move out to the peach orchard because he believes it's better ground than what it is back here. He will be in the low ground off to our left on the morning of July 2nd. And if you're down there looking up to the west, yeah, that ground looks more important than this. So that's why he's going to start moving out there right? and disobeying orders, which he gets away with. And he even gets a Medal of Honor uh, for that. As we go along the ridge here, this cemetery ridge we're on now, there's going to be a hole here in the Union line. And that will be filled by General John Sedgwick and the Union 6th Corps. They will arrive on the battlefield around 7 o'clock in the evening on July 2nd. Those guys are the furthest away from Gettysburg. When George Meade starts moving north here to Gettysburg, he's got to defend Washington, D.C. and Baltimore, so he's spreading his army out. Sedgwick's men, that 6th Corps, will be 36 miles to our east when the fighting starts on July 1st. They get the order to march to Gettysburg at 8.30 at night, and they will start marching at 9 o'clock that night. They will march for 22 straight hours, get here and go right into the fight over here to our left and help stop the Confederates. The longest march in American military history from a camp into a battle. It's not the longest march, though. The Union 11th Corps, when it left here, will march 41 miles. But that's from a camp to a camp. All right. In this area here on the morning of July 2nd, 1863, there's going to be about 4,000 Union troops here on this hill. These men all end up in the wheat field, which is to our left rear. Before the Irish Brigade marches off into that fight, Father Corby, whose statue is coming up here on our right, will give absolution to those Irishmen before they go off. That's just memorialized here. He does that at every battlefield that uh, he's at. Because that's all for, for those troops every time. Now coming up that hill to your left, and out in the distance to your left, is the Peach Orchard. And here comes that Confederate Brigade up that hill. A New York Brigade will come down off Cemetery Ridge, go down that hill and stop those Confederates. Another Confederate Brigade is going to be coming up the ridge here to our front left, about 1,300 of them. And the 1st Minnesota, whose monument's coming up here on our left, 220 men will charge down that hill into those Confederate troops. The 1st Minnesota will lose 80% of their men in that charge. But they stop those Confederates and buy time for more Union troops to get here. The large monument to your right is the Pennsylvania State Monument. Around the base are the names of the 34,000 Pennsylvanians that fought here. And on the middle, you got some Pennsylvania generals. And on the front, you got two politicians. You've got Andrew Curtin, who's the governor, and Abraham Lincoln on there. And he's the president. That monument cost around $400,000 to build back in 1910. I had somebody on the bus a couple of weeks ago, he, uh, little kid, he, uh, he did the math. $12.5 million to build that now, all right, in today's money. <laughs> to get all those names of all those troops that are on the base of that monument, they pulled the pay records from July, June 30th, 1863. So the day before this battle is fought, these men get paid. $13 for the month, you have to sign a piece of paper. That's what they use to create the month or get all those names. Now, July 1st is a Confederate victory. There are 16,000 casualties on that first day of battle. On July 2nd, it is a draw. The fighting didn't start until 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and it will end around 10 o'clock that night. 
This is one of the few occasions during the Civil War that we will have fighting at night. Usually they stop fighting. But at 10 o'clock that fighting ends, and in those six hours of fighting, there will be 20,000 casualties. So we still got one more day to talk about. We're going to go over here in that shade, and we're going to talk about July 3rd, 1863. monument around the front of it there, on the book, it has all the troops that fought in this assault, both north and south. In 1872-73 time frame, uh, John Batchelder, who was our first true chief historian here at Gettysburg, will be sitting on a rock around the front of the, the trees here, and he will ask, Pickett's chief of staff where you were going. And he said that chief of staff says right here. So that's why this is here. Pickett will die in 1872, so he hasn't been dead long when they have this meeting. John Batchelder is the man that will come down here shortly after the battle is over. He will start to interview soldiers in the hospitals. He will go down to Virginia and interview officers and men that fought here, what they did. When the war ends, he will correspond with Confederates. And when those veterans come back to the battlefield, he will walk the field with those men. So when the men from the 106th Pennsylvania or the 69th Pennsylvania come here, they say, this is where we were. He writes it down in a ledger. And when it comes time to put these monuments up, he goes back to his ledger and says, yeah, okay, you can put your money. So that's how we got the monuments. Now, July 3rd, 1863. It's the hottest day of that month. 1863, it's 90 degrees. It's about 100% humidity. And there ain't no wind. Gettysburg Magazine, there's an article in there about the weather. They put the modern stuff we use in it. About 113 would have been the heat index. These trees that were that are providing us this shade were not this big. These trees were about as big as that little one over there, or maybe that little one there. Alright, they weren't that big at all. So there's not a lot of shade up here. And these Union men are laying out here in these fields in this sun. Now the Union line will run from Cemetery Hill, well from Culp's Hill above the blue truck, to Cemetery Hill behind George Meade's statue, around to the guns up there by the road where that guy on the bicycle is. But it will stop at that point and it will pick up down here at this tree just on the other side of this monument here. When you read about Pickett's Charge and they talk about the angle, where that tree is is where the stone wall makes a 90 degree turn. That Union line will run from that tree all the way down the Little Round Top. So you've got men and guns all the way up along that line. 
86 Union Cannons from Little Round Top to Cemetery Hill, and about 4,000 Union Infantrymen here to defend this position. And on the morning and into the early afternoon of July 3rd, they're watching Confederate cannons go into position. Out there across the fields, there's the Virginia Monument. All right, that's where General Lee will be when this attack goes across the field. The Virgin or the North Carolina Monument, where we were earlier, is kind of over to the right of that, and you may be able to see a bus over there in the trees. All right, so that's where we were earlier, looking across here. All right. You said that's about two miles. That's a mile. A mile. That's a mile. Okay. So those guns can easily reach both ways. Lee will get those 150 cannons in position, those 12,000 men in position over there as well. And at 1 o'clock, James Longstreet will say, let the batteries open. <coughs> Longstreet does not believe this attack will succeed, but he's a soldier and he will follow his orders. He will tell General Lee that morning that there are no 12,000 men ever assembled that can take this position. But Lee says, uh, my army can and it will. He's got confidence in his army. So at 1 o'clock, Longstreet gives that order, let the batteries open. Two guns fire from the Peach Orchard. Those shells come screaming into here. We don't know where they land, because I kid you not, every one of these regimental histories say those shells landed in our area. <laughs> so we have no idea where they are. What we do know is that when they fired, 148 Confederate cannons will fire almost simultaneously. All of those shells coming in there. 86 Union cannons will fire back. Now, because there's no uh, wind, the smoke will stay in place. So when these guns roll back four to six feet, you got to roll it back in place. You can't find the target. So a lot of those Confederate guns will overshoot. And when they overshoot, they're hitting on the other side of the road where the bus is. Now that road wasn't there at the time of the battle is. All they're doing is helping that farmer plow that field. <laughs> the Union guns, they're gonna overshoot as well. But when they do, they're hitting the Confederate infantry getting ready to make the attack. So they're taking casualties before they even move. Bombardment supposed to last 30 minutes. Edward Porter Alexander is looking for the desired effect. And what the desired effect is, is driving off Union cannons. Well, after 30 minutes, he can't tell. So he lets the bombardment go another 30 minutes. Then another 30 minutes. We're at an hour and a half. They can hear these guns in Harrisburg. 46 miles to our north. They can hear them in Baltimore, 58 miles southeast of us. They can hear it in Chestnut Hills, right outside of Philadelphia, 90 miles away. These gunners' ears are bleeding. Well, there's a lot of accounts that these guys are here. They don't have hair protection back there. Just stuff whatever you can in your head. <laughs> About an hour and 45 minutes, though, the Union guns will start to slacken their fire. The smoke will lift. Alexander will see 18 cannons leave the line. He will pin a note to pick it. For God's sakes, come now. The 18 guns are gone. If you don't come now, I can't support you. He's about to run out of ammunition. Pickett takes that note to Longstreet. Longstreet can't say the words. He just nods his head. And pick it, ask for permission to go forward. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 12,000 men will come out of those fields over there and start moving this way. As they come out into those fields, these Union guns will open back up. you got 10, 20 men at a time going down out there. Those Confederates, though, they close up and they keep moving. They get to the road. they got to cross that fence. They tried to take that fence down, 
but it's too strong, so they got to climb over. The 106 Pennsylvania here on the morning of July 2nd, they go out there and try to take that fence down. They can't get it down either, and nobody's shooting at them when they go out there. That's how strong that fence is up. And so the farmers, when they bring their cows in to sell them the cattle and stuff, they want the roads to keep them. That's why the fences are so strong. The Confederates cross to this side. That is when 4,000 Union men stand up, send 4,000 rounds down range. These cannons will start firing this lovely weapon called canister. When the cannon fires, the casing that holds the canister will disintegrate. It looks like a giant soda can. And inside that soda can is 24 to 48 iron balls. Turns those cannons into giant shotguns. Confederates close up and they keep moving. They break through here about where the monument is with the soldiers swinging the rifle. Lewis Armistead will lead that last group of men over. He's got anywhere from 400 to 800 men when he comes over that wall. Lewis Armistead will get to about that leftmost, that closest cannon to us, just in front of it. It's a little monument out there. That's where Armistead will be mortally wounded. About mortally wounded. All right. When he goes down, he is the last of Pickett's brigade commanders. The officers and men look back across those fields. There ain't nobody coming to help. Him. They're coming up from behind the trees and across these fields here are Union troops coming in from every direction on this fish hook to close this breach. So the Confederates will fall back to the wall, back to the road, all the way back across to the Virginia Monument, where Lee is. And Lee will say, like I said earlier, it's all my fault. I thought we were invincible. 12,000 men will make that charge. Only 6,000 of them will make it back. Lee's got no more fresh troops to throw in the fight, so he will pull his men off Colts Hill, out of Devil's Den, off the Peach Orchard. They will stay over there on Seminary Ridge all day July 4th. They're hoping that Meade will attack, but Meade does not. And on the afternoon of July 3rd, it's going to start raining, or July 4th, I'm sorry, it's going to start raining heavily. Lee will start his wagon train of wounded over that mountain that night. That wagon train will be 17 miles long. Goes over the mountain, makes the left, heads toward Hagerstown. The Confederates will re retreat out of here on the 5th, heading to Hagerstown. The Union Army will pursue on the 6th. Lee will beat Meade to Hagerstown, and he will cross the Potomac on the 13th of July into the morning of the 14th of July, ending the Gettysburg campaign. Any questions? All right. Please, the Union Army, before they pull out, they will bury most of the dead on this end of the battlefield. That includes the Confederates. They will bury the Union troops with Union troops. Confederate troops will be basically thrown in a large burial trench. All right, there will have to be quite a few of them out there. There's about 8,000 men that will be killed here. There's about 5,000 horses and mules that are killed here. The horses and mules, it's easier to burn them. So that's what they do. The Union dead will lay out here in their graves until the fall of 1863 when they are moved to the National Cemetery up on the hill here. We'll see in a sec. The Confederate dead will lay out there in their graves until 1872. That is when they will be disinterred and moved to cemeteries in the south. Richmond, Raleigh, Savannah, and Charleston is where they're buried. David Wills and Andrew Curtin, the governor of Pennsylvania, will tour this battlefield a couple of weeks after the fighting is over, and they will see arms and legs sticking up out of the ground here. So David Wills will be uh, assigned to purchase the land up here, 
On the high ground in front of us up on Cemetery Hill, 17 acres, and set that aside for the Union dead. David Wills is also in charge of the dedication ceremony, so he will invite Edward Everett to come and speak. Now, Edward Everett is the great orator of the day. If you've got something going on, you want Ed there to talk. Well, Everett will get up and talk for two hours. Abraham Lincoln's invitation said, come and say a few appropriate remarks. It was only three weeks prior to the event. Lincoln will get up and talk for two minutes, 272 words. That's the greatest speech ever given on the North American continent. And up there on the highest point of the most important hill, to your left, is where the 3,600 Union soldiers are buried. These graves you see there to your left, those are from World War II all the way back to the Spanish-American War. Edward Everett will congratulate Lincoln for summing up in two minutes what he couldn't do in two hours. I can't imagine standing there for two hours listening to somebody talk. But different times. Meade's headquarters is here to your right. Just over that hill to your right is going to be where Pickett's charge occurs. And some of those overshoots will land back here. Well, one of those cannonballs will hit a horse, one of the staff officers of General Meade, and he will run into headquarters, grab a pistol, run back out and shoot the wrong horse. So he's got to shoot another one. So two more on the fire. Now the armies will go back into Virginia and fight for another year and a half. 1864 will be the bloodiest year of the American Civil War. And in 1865, April 9th, 1865, General Lee will surrender to General Grant at Appomattox Courthouse, and that will end the American Civil War. George Meade is still in command of the Army of the Potomac. He is just overshadowed by General Grant, because Grant will be brought east in March of 1864, promoted to Lieutenant General, which is four stars, so he is senior and general-in-chief of all Union armies. Grant knows that as long as Robert E. Lee has an army in the field, the South still has a heartbeat. So Grant will go with me to make sure that heart starts, stops beating. That's why you don't hear about General Meade anymore. But he does win the battle here and stay in command. Locust. They're going to take anything and everything they can use. Both sides, not just Confederates. That's going to leave the people in town here with not much. So the U.S. Christian Commission and the U.S. Sanitary Commission will come in and they will aid with the wounded soldiers because both armies will also leave about 12,000 wounded soldiers here that they will have to take care of and feed. So they're here to help the Army feed those guys and feed the, the people in town. By the end of August, no, by the end of July, 1863, uh, the Christian Commission, they will report that they've got more food in the Fonstock building downtown than they have for the people here in town. So that's how the families will live and survive that winter of 63, 64. The other thing that's going on around here is the smell. There, you've got 170,000 men, 100,000 horses, doing what we do. Then you got all the dead and dying and the decay. So you got all that as well, too. They said you could smell Gettysburg 20 miles in every direction. The people in town and out here in the countryside, just to walk around, you got to... Dip, your, uh, dip a handkerchief and peppermint, put it up to your face so you can breathe. That summer, you can't raise your windows because of the smell and the heat and the fog, or the flies, I'm sorry. The flies were terrible here as well, too. But they get through it. It's really not until 1865 before this town gets back up on its feet again. Well, as we pull back into the visitor center, I'd like to thank you 
for your attention and uh, hope you've enjoyed the last couple of hours. I hope you learned something. And uh, enjoy the rest of your stay here in Gettysburg. And to all the veterans on the bus, thank you for your service. Just off the bus, if you got any questions or anything, um, you might still have lingering that I might have explained clearly. 50th anniversary of battle, which included approximately 50,000 Civil War veterans. After a multi-year cleaning and restoration project, which began in 2003, found its permanent home in this building in 2008. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. My name is Dennis Roberts to my left. We'd like to take this opportunity and thank you for visiting the historic Gettysburg and making us part of your day.